Hi and welcome to the Journalism Salute. I'm Mark Simon. In each episode, we'll talk to or about an interesting person or organization related to journalism. The intent is to show that journalists are not the enemy of the people. Thank you for listening. On this episode, we're joined by Ali Singer. Ali is a senior editor for special projects at Time Magazine for Kids with previous stops at Scholastic and DK Publishing. Ali and I are both graduates of the College of New Jersey. I'm class of 97. She's class of 2009. Hi, Ali. Thanks for joining me. Hey, Mark. Thanks for having me. We've done more than 60 episodes. We've talked to people who write about kids. We've focused on education in a couple of instances, but we haven't talked to anyone about writing for kids. And Ali's going to tell us about that. But before we do that, I want you to first explain the, the story of the path of your journalism career. Sure, that, that's easy, sure. So let's see. So like you said, we're both TCNJ alums. I went there to become a teacher. Um, I had always loved working with kids. I was a camp counselor. I was a babysitter. I was a dance teacher. I always worked with kids. So I thought that would be a natural fit. When I got there, one of my favorite bands at the time, Straylight Run, was coming to the school and I wanted to meet them. So I joined The Signal, the newspaper, um, and got that assignment and just realized I loved that so much more. I loved the reporting. I wanted to learn more about journalism. I switched my major, I think, in my sophomore year, kept reporting for The Signal, got some internships in journalism, and then got an internship in book publishing, which I loved. Um, moved over there once I got out of school. Uh, I went to Scholastic and that was like the perfect combination of kids and content um, and kind of took off from there. I've been working on children's nonfiction ever since, both in books and in magazines. I like the story of the serendipitous moment with the band uh, that led from, from you becoming a someone who was going to be in teaching to someone who is going to be in journalism. I'm curious, is there anything from your upbringing that would have lent itself to a journalism path? Oh, it's a good question. Um, let's see. I mean, my my grandmother was a teacher and my grandfather was, were, they were both teachers. So going towards kids, that made sense. I don't think anyone else in my family was a journalist, but I did really like journalism when I was a kid. I wrote letters to the editor of our community newspaper, which my mom still has in a scrapbook somewhere. Um, a poem that got published. I created my own kids with a Z news with a Z newspaper for my cul-de-sac when I was young. So I guess I was always kind of heading in that direction. I just growing up in suburban New Jersey, didn't think that it was something that actual people did. You know, it always seemed far away. And when I got to college, I found out, Hey, I could actually maybe do that. So, uh, so yeah, maybe there were some upbringing signs. Nice. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you further about our alma mater, and we can uh, shout out whoever you'd like to shout out. Um, what was your uh, experience like, especially as someone making the conversion? You went to a college that was very teacher oriented, uh, teacher preparation oriented, making the conversion to journalism, and who helped you out along the way? Yeah, I went exactly. I went to TCNJ because they had such a good teaching program, um, but I was so lucky that they also had just an excellent journalism program. So many of the people I graduated with are working in journalism today. Um, I have to, of course, say Kim Pearson, who you and I both had as a professor. She was fantastic. I learned so much from her. Um, also would love to shout out Jess Rao, who was my teacher for writing communities and some creative writing courses. He took the class to New York City and we went to a book publisher. I think it was F and G. And I just remember sitting there and looking around and seeing people kind of moving and creating and there were tons of bookshelves and thinking like, oh, wow, this is a career. I could do that. Um, so shout out to Jess as well. And now you are doing that. Um, I want to quote, we're going to do this a couple of times. I'm going to quote from your social media. <laughs> Oh boy. Uh, because I, okay. I feel like this is, it's, it's instructive, it's interesting too, because of the way you explain it. And I was thinking, how would I try and explain myself in the same manner? You said, I'm as happy working with a writer to strengthen a story as I am reimagining re re -imagining an outdated process. And I'm as comfortable presenting at launch meetings as I am diving into a new CMS. I have an editor's heart and a managing editor's mind, or maybe it's the other way around. How did mm -hmm. that develop? Yeah, I, I don't know if I would consider myself like an editor's editor. Like I know a lot of people who don't care at all about metadata and publicity and business and legal, and they just want to sit with the text and think about the story. I do love doing that, but I care about the rest of the world too. 
I started in production, thinking about paper quantity, thinking about card stock for the cover, thinking about specs. Um, loved that. Um, at DK Publishing, I was in charge of all the metadata and the content management system. I totally nerded out about that. Super happy just sitting there cleaning things up. So I've, I still haven't yet figured out in my career which direction I'm heading, but I love working on the content and I also love working on the world around it. And I tend to be a very organized, color-coded kind of person, which in my experience, not, a, a, all, not all editors are. So I've got both sides of the brain working on that. The color-coded thing, I feel like that's a managing editor uh, yes. kind of trait, so to speak. Definitely. So when I was 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, I was reading the newspaper, and I imagine I was an aberration, but I was also reading Weekly Reader with my classmates, and you'd get big stories that were shortened to four and five paragraphs. I'm old enough to remember them profiling someone like Geraldine Ferraro when she was running as the vice presidential nominee in 1984. Um, there was also the TV show Children's Express. One of my listeners worked on that, and I, I know what that is. I use that as a springboard to ask, what's time for kids and what are its goals? So time for kids is part of Time Magazine, which sounds like it should be obvious, but isn't always to people. Um, we're the classroom edition of Time Magazine. We also have a website and a home product. And generally, our goals are to give kids information that they need to understand the world which as you and I know is a super complicated place right now, maybe more than ever. When I got there in 2018, I was working on a lot of sports, entertainment, kind of fun stories um, alongside some trickier stuff, some government stories, some science stories. And then in March, 2020, I don't know if you remember, but the pandemic hit and things got really complicated. Of course, we all went home, but explaining something to kids that adults yet didn't understand was a huge challenge. So I would say our goal was to give them the information they needed to understand and process it because it's you're much less likely to be afraid of something when you understand it a bit more. So that maybe that's my personal goal, but that's what we do at Time for Kids. I wanna come back to that in a second, but first I wanna ask, what does a special projects editor do? A special projects editor at Time for Kids does what I do because I am the only one. I would say everything except the magazine. So when I was a senior editor um, proper, I worked on the stories for the magazine, what we were going to publish when, et cetera. Um, now as special projects, I also do things like um, special editions of the magazine coupled with American Girl, you know, on fantastic women in history. I manage our kid reporter program, which is 10 or 15 amazing kids we select each year to go out and report the news. Um, I do some licensing work. I help come up with new ideas. We're doing activity books that are on newsstands now. Um, so basically anything outside the world of the magazine proper that goes into classrooms. Now, you were talking before about trying to explain things to kids. So is there like some sort of a, uh, I, I would imagine it's, it's multiple people involved in discussion, workshopping, uh, language, and things of that sort. Is there mm -hmm. uh, an example you can provide on uh, process? Sure. I mean, one, one comes top of mind today, which is, of course, Ukraine. We had a conversation, like you said, every, every story that we deal with on a tough topic is talked about by everyone on our team. We have morning meetings where everyone is invited and involved and we, we talk about, you know, A, is this story appropriate for kids? Is it something they're going to be wondering about? How do we best tell it to them? What format do we use? You know, is an interview with someone high up going to be the best way? Is a Q&A maybe the best way? We decide where to place it. You know, is it a cover story? You know, going out into classrooms. Is it something we provide to teachers and parents with some resources for how best to teach it? Is that the best way if it's something super scary, especially for younger kids? So every story we talk about um, on a tricky level is something we have a lot of buy-in from everybody. With Ukraine today, you know, we had our conversation in the morning meeting. We decided we do need to talk about it. Um, we had an executive editor kind of take a first crack, and then I would say maybe three, four people looking at it throughout the day, making sure we felt like it was shaping up right, word choice was right. You know, when you're working with kids, where do you start? Do you tell them the news? Do you have to tell them Ukraine is a country? So a lot of times we work with our curriculum team to see at what level which 
grade readers are at. It's a lot of work, but then at the end, it's something we can be proud of. Yeah, I was looking at um, how you uh, how you covered or how you uh, referenced Martin Luther King Jr. Um, mm -hmm. in trying to explain him to different age levels, whether it was all the way down at the five and six year olds, all the way up to the twelves. And I saw that for the fives and the sixes, you you, cert you introduced certain um, concepts trying to explain racism essentially mm -hmm. um and mm -hmm. i would imagine uh that that's that that's difficult are there any that you've done recently besides ukraine uh today where there were really difficult decisions that had to be made along the way to the, maybe to the murder of george floyd um talking about how to cover that was really difficult obviously it's something important and something kids know about and need the facts about um but how much information do you give how much, how long of a piece can you write, right? We could write, you know, 6,000 words if they're only gonna get through the first hundred, that's not useful. So that's one thing that comes to mind. Um, when Trump was impeached, we were covering that. And I think what, Ameri what Americans, what adults sometimes forget is, you know, that's scary when you're a first grader, what you know about the president is that they're the leader of the country and they're in charge and don't worry, you're safe when the president of the country could be taken out of that role, that is a scary thing. So figuring out how to cover that for first graders, uh, which I'm, I honestly, I'm not sure if we did um, versus third or fifth or even our middle school um, website um, was very different, but an interesting conversation nonetheless. And there are other things that you include within these stories, visuals, certainly uh, power words. You have, there's a section called power words where mm -hmm. they explain vocabulary. Uh, to younger kids. Um, what other things do uh, come into play when designing an entire package? Yeah, so we, we have a lot that um, is offered behind the scenes. So what you're seeing on the page is what kids see, and it does have power words, visuals with captions, full stories, decks, headlines, etc. cetera. Um, behind the scenes, we're providing materials for parents and teachers. We're providing worksheets. We're providing resources. Um, on tough topics, we'll provide lists, long lists of resources that you can go to different organization, organizations, trusted sources um, that can help you um, and your family. I'm trying to think what else. We, we often ask kids to engage with us, which helps a lot. We have in the magazine something called TFK Press Club, where we'll ask a question, ask kids to write to us about it. We post those letters. I think that helps kids feel not so much alone if they're concerned about a topic and they see another kid is also concerned. So we just kind of do our best to tell whatever story we're trying to tell in a way that engages them, informs them, and you know, makes them feel like they kind of have a handle on what's going on in the world. Education at the local levels is currently under attack by conservative groups that are attempting to censor books, dictate what's in textbooks, to basically shield their children from some harsh American truths particularly in the South, in the West, uh, Midwest as well. Has time had to deal with any of that? I can't speak to if we've had to deal with any of it directly. I think I'm, if we have, I'm maybe shielded from. I, I will say that sure, we, we do get, you know, some subscribers who aren't always happy with how we've covered a story or a story in the magazine. Um, and we respond to anyone who has a concern, we hear them out. But in the end, because we have all those people kind of talking about how we want to cover it, we have experts weighing in on the format that we've chosen, et cetera. Um, we feel pretty confident that the approach we choose is um, what is going to be the most helpful for the most number of people. You mentioned that you supervise kid reporters. And uh, one example of that is a recent interview that uh, was done with the Surgeon General of the United States about kids' mental health. Um, can you tell us about both that and the program that you're supervising? Sure, the, the program I'll start with, it's, it's probably my favorite part of the job. Um, the TFK Kid Reporters, we have a contest every April. Every April, we receive hundreds of applications from kids around the country and we choose 10. They come on, they have a mentor on our team, one of the writers or editors on our team and we have them writing all sorts of stories. Uh, I'm actually editing today a cover story by one of our kid reporters, Orly in Chicago um, who's writing about independent bookstores. And they're just these incredible kids who are so curious and so eager to write and are probably headed to TCNJ for the journalism program and gonna take my job in you know 15 years, which is great. 
So I love working with them. For the Surgeon General story, so the United States Surgeon General just released um, a report essentially saying that kids' mental health is in crisis. We have a relationship with him. We talked about how do we want to cover this. We decided to do a cover story. And TFK Kid reporter Ronick interviewed him over Zoom, got lots of great information. And then he and I worked together on a piece. Again, not to scare kids. It is scary. There's a mental health crisis, but to give them all the information and to give them ideas for how they can feel a bit better or reach out to someone to help if they're struggling. And yeah, Ronick did a great job. Again, he's one of those kids that's going to be, you know, in our seats one day, I think. Something you might find interesting, actually, is that our kid reporters have a podcast that I help produce. um, And each week they report the news. um, They read news stories. They also interview the cover story journalist for that week's magazine issue. They play something called Fact or Fishy, which is where they look at a news headline and try and determine if it's fake news or not. They're just absolutely incredible, these kids. They're making videos, they're writing, they're doing podcasts. I wish when I was their age that I, you know, had the foresight to learn about multimedia. I guess it wasn't quite where it is today, um, but they're just doing a great job. Did you, uh, do you like mentor them? Do you like have like a pre-meeting to discuss like, hey, here's, here are some of the things, like all that sort of stuff? Yeah, yeah, the whole nine. So when we sign up uh, new kid reporters and I get my mentees, I you know, meet with them uh, over Zoom. We talk about who they'd love to interview. I try to make some of their dream interviews happen throughout the year if I can. Some are easier than others. One kid last year really wanted to interview Beyonce and I just couldn't do it. <laughs> um, but, you know, some, sometimes it happens. They've interviewed some pretty amazing people. Um, one of our reporters in Washington, D.C. just met with the um, Treasury Secretary and did a great interview there. I got to go to the building. It was incredible. Um, So yeah, we mentor them along the way. Uh, We talk about their questions before an interview. We talk about the outline for their story, explain any edits that I'm making. It's, it's really like working just with a young reporter. Oh, that's, that's okay. That's awesome. That was my, my next question was going to be, how are the kids in terms of receptiveness and how, like, how much does a kid know compared to what you or I would have known when we were that age? Sure. Totally depends on the kid. I mean, the ones that we have are just so talented. Um, Orly, who's writing the story right now about bookstores, when she turned in her first draft, I was like, this is just as good as I could have done. This is amazing. I don't know who looked at this or if this really just flowed out of you, but you just did an amazing job. Um, and some of the kids, of course, need a little bit of work. I can think of one who I, who I won't name. But um, great interview, love to talk to people, had so many interesting questions, Um, writing skills, not quite there. But by the end of the year, he was doing great. You know, I love that they learn in this program and we get to see some of those kid reporters go on and get jobs at different publications, which just feels awesome. This is this is nice for you because I suppose it satisfies the teaching aspect of things and the journalistic side you get to it's like the perfect uh combination that's uh, cool what's the hardest part of the job uh in general the hardest part of of my job at the moment I would say it's just being you know a bit of a juggler there's a lot going on which is a great thing um but trying to figure out you know what's the most important trying to manage my time I'm a person who really likes to work in the office. I've been home for about two years, so I've had to kind of redo all my organizational methods a bit. I think I've got a handle on it now, so that's tricky. And then in my special projects role, uh, trying to imagine new ways to use our content that we haven't done before and then push those through. Um, But that's a challenge I kind of don't mind doing. I love that being enterprising and convincing people, you know, that, that you've come up with a good idea is the hardest part, but um, also something I like doing. Thinking both present and future, uh, certainly. I want to go back again to social media, Twitter this time, because your pin tweet was uh, cool. It was the answer to a question about the fundamental theme of your profession. Uh, This was asked by, it was asked by Hank Green, and uh, you said your answer to his question was editing, learn all the rules, and then break them properly. Uh, what did you, what did you mean by that? And uh, do you have a rule breaking anecdote that might be instructive? <laughs> um, let's see. What did I mean by that? Well, learn all the rules. I think is obvious. I think it's important to be you know well educated and and know grammar and punctuation and spelling and all of that great stuff and how to structure a story. That's important. But 
I just think that once you have all that information in place, you can make some smart choices about where it doesn't make sense. My copy editor is someone I, I love. His name's Mike and he's great, but he's so surly and we get into arguments all the time. And I just say, that's just not the way, you know, kids write that word anymore. And we fight um, trying to think of a good example. Well, a bugaboo of mine, of course, is internet capped. Um, I'll, I'll fight that fight till, till I'm dead. But, you know, I, I just think that sometimes you're doing a disservice to your readers by sticking hard and fast to the rules when they don't make sense. A specific example you're asking for, I, uh, in my spare time, I'm a freelancer for YA novels. And I'll just say, if you stuck to the rules when you're editing texts between teenagers, uh, you're not selling any books. That's just not the way they talk. So yeah, I just think if you can find creative and consistent ways to break the rules or make up new ones and stick to them, that your editing will, will be a lot better. You mentioned uh, your freelance work. Do you have aspirations to write a book? Of course, don't we all? Yes, I, I very much used to want to write a book. Um, it's kind of fallen by the wayside as I've as I've fallen in love with editing and, and magazines and all the work that I'm doing now. I've written a couple um, just for when I was at DK Publishing. I, I wrote a few small books, not ones that I would say I you know sat and really toiled over. One day, sure, I would, I would love to, to see my name on the cover of something I'm really, really proud of, sure. Is there a journalist or journalism organization that you're not affiliated with whom you would like to salute? Oh, yeah. Can I salute Teen Vogue? I have absolutely no ties to them whatsoever. I would, I would love to meet the people working there. I just think that they're doing such a great job. Um, a, I love reading them so, read it. A, I love reading their stuff just as a reader myself, um, but they are so good at synthesizing complicated information in an engaging way for their audience, which is a bit older than mine, right? I'm just really editing content for kids up to about 12. Um, they pick up from there. Um, I just think they're so funny and interesting and on the ball. Um, also love their Twitter account. Shout out to whoever their social media manager is over there too think they're doing a great job. Um, so it is Women's History Month, and uh, we are interviewing women journalists throughout the month, and we are also saluting women journalists in history. Do you have a favorite woman in journalism history? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I am going to cheat this question slightly, if it's okay, and say um, a favorite book editor in women's history, um, and actually it's even cheating more because she's presently a book editor still. Um, I'm going to shout out to Lisa Abrams, who just started a new imprint of books for teenagers, I believe, called Labyrinth Road. Um, she's someone who I looked up to when I was an intern at Simon & Schuster because she published books that made her feel something that she really cared about. Um, I know a lot of people who work really hard to publish books that will sell or books that meet some sort of trend. Um, and Lisa is just publishing these amazing books, inclusive books that are so powerful because they mean something to her and because of that she's able to get them to mean something to their readers as well. Um, so that's something that I aspire to do, to really have a voice and have an opinion and know what kind of content moves me and then to find a way to translate that for my readers. Sounds like you're well on your way. Ali Singer, uh, thank you for taking the time to join us. Best of luck. Thank you. Thanks so much. Welcome to Journalism History, a podcast that rips out the pages of your history books to re-examine the stories you thought you knew and the ones you were never told. I'm Terry Finneman, and I research media coverage of women in politics. And I'm Nick Hershaw, and I research the history of New York sports. And I'm Ken Ward, and I research the journalism history of the Great Plains and Rocky Mountains. Find the Journalism History Podcast at journalism-history.org slash podcast, and wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Thank you for listening to the Journalism Salute. Please let us know what you think of the show. You can find us on Twitter at journalismpod, and you can email us at journalismsalute at gmail.com.